Hey everyone, I'm Alan Schimmel. And Mitchell Ashley. And you're listening or watching DevOps Chats. Fantastic. Hey Mitchell, I think we it took us, what's this, the fourth one that since we restarted the series and we finally got it right. That's I right. Thought, Old habits never die. I guess we, I no. guess they do. But that's the fourth. Well, try. we just had to get our timing down, and because you know when we used to record these, we didn't have Zoom and latency issues. We were sitting next to each other. That's right. Yes, and you uh, know, and uh, you know, and Chantilly, Virginia, are getting ready to go or wherever we were, were on the road. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, but <laughs> but, that's but that's progress for you. Um, exactly. Or maybe not. <laughs> anyway, Mitchell, we we've got a good DevOps chat. Uh, lined up for this week, we're, we're going to start incorporating something we really wanted to do, which was to kind of leverage this amazing library of interviews that we have from TechStrong TV, mm -hmm. you know, that really take great dives into, you know, a subject like DevOps. We look at it six ways from Sunday, right? Into every aspect. Yeah. And um, so I'm excited to do that today. And we're going to, it's an interview you did. Yeah, with uh, right. Ben Potter from Coder. We'll, we'll get into that very much so. You know, there are over 6,000 videos on TechStrong TV now. It's That's crazy. DevOps, our uh, TechStrong TV YouTube channel is just like packed with content. I think also it's probably 4,000 or more. There. We might have purged it at one point, but I think it was 4,000 or something. Mm -hmm. And we'll be adding more to that, including this podcast. We're going to start running on the YouTube because we wind up playing episodes of the podcast now on the TechStrong TV daily feed, which then makes its way over to the TechStrong TV YouTube channel yep. as well. So, you know, this is like uh, trying to look up old Star Trek episodes on where you can see them on streaming TV, and they're on they're on Paramount and Netflix and and Pluto TV and and uh, you know all these other stations. Well, I think I it's the same that. way. I joined a Facebook group um, that's all about the original Star Trek, and I get all these posts, you know, like, remember this episode? Remember this? The Doom Machine? Remember this? Mm -hmm. Who was this character? I, I, I think <laughs> I belong to the same chat, to the same group. <laughs> that's pretty freaky. I told you, I, I recently got a really great, I haven't seen you yet, so I haven't, I haven't even worn it yet. I may just save it for a while, but it's it's the Star Trek episode with the alternate universe, Spock with the oh, beard. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. evil Spock, but kind of he, you know still good still spot. still right he still had the good core yeah i can't maybe i'll save that for rsa i'll wear that one day i think so um, KubeCon or both maybe both yeah. yeah or maybe KubeCon in paris um mitchell before we jump into ben potter interview though i, I thought we'd spend a little time talking about DevOps Next, as we're calling this great report you're you're starting to frame out right now. Um, but really, the report is just a reflection of the actual marketplace, mm -hmm. which is, you know, next month, March 14th, actually, will be the 10th anniversary of DevOps.com. First time we published DevOps.com. Wow, time flies. <laughs> yeah. And DevOps... You know, DevOps has been around at least two years before that, mm -hmm. at least, maybe three. Um, but it's not the same DevOps. Well, in many ways it is, but in many ways it isn't the same DevOps as it was 12 years ago, right? And why don't you, you know, take first crack at this? You know, how do you think DevOps is different or how do you think it's even the same? as it was then. I still remember you calling me up and say, hey, Mitch, um, it, it, there's this thing called DevOps. Do you know, know anything about this? I've, I've got the domain for this DevOps.com. We're starting this site. And you know, I was like, no, I'm not really that up on it. Let me go figure it out. And I went and read Gene's Kim book, his book, and then introduced it to the IT team that I was running back then. Um, but it, it was really early and it was, it was kind of hard to figure out exactly what it was. And then people started doing it and kind of learned some of the principles out of the book. And one of my first ahas was, okay, it's not a technology, it's a how. It's how you do software, how you create software. And technology is all in support of that. And it's kind of rethinking that. And of course, the, having the cloud and elastic resources available to you could change how you do software and microservices and cloud native came along. 
So it's interesting. It's kind of like the way Agile was that it really transformed away from monolithic thinking or waterfall thinking to more sprint and iteration, but doing that in a whole software development process and in pipelines. But it was still very tool centric in terms of this tool fits in this slice, this tool fits in this slice, and this fits here, and they all have their own ecosystem of plugins, or maybe they integrate, or maybe they don't. So you end up in the tool integration business as an IT team or development team. And today we're, you know, it feels like we're at a different place. I mean, it's it's not everywhere. And not everyone is doing DevOps at the same level. They're all on their own kind of curve of adoption. Some have been doing it for quite a while, but we've gotten to this place where there are platforms that you can do end-to-end -end DevOps if that's how your organization kind of thinks about solving this. There are sort of much broader suites. You start out as a CI tool, now we're a CI CD, and we're this, this, and that and with security and with AI and with this. So all, all that to say, the reason why we're doing this DevOps Next report is to try to lay out and help everyone, all of us understand, including, including me, understanding where we really are in, in the evolution of DevOps, but more importantly, how that's setting us up DevOps Next for the next three, five plus years as we introduce more things, more AI, more generative AI, more different kinds of applications, more mobile to the apps that we're doing already on the web or whatever the next technology or, or approach uh, driver that comes along, app modernization, whatever it might be. To, to really recognize that it isn't just a set of discrete disciplines that we're hanging together in a linear process. It is really an ecosystem of capabilities that we can craft into the best way to create software. I love it. You know, listening to you, Mitchell, I'm, I'm reminded of the old commercial line. I think it was Orson Welles, you know, for Gala Winery or whatever. You can't make wine before it's time. Uh, <laughs> and you know what? You can't make DevOps before it's time either. Can you can you have a DevOps without Agile? Mm. Can you have a DevOps without Lean? Mm -hmm. Could you have DevOps without the cloud? Exactly. Can you have cloud native without DevOps? I think that we're pretty sure. No, <laughs> but yes. Yeah. I mean, to your, to your point is, it is. I mean, whether you're going to go. Go back to the manufacturing side or think about how we're using agile and lean and software the other thing that's happened with devops you know well as i do is it's the ideas behind it everybody has said well i can do that in my part of the business right i can do that in the product group i can do that in operations i can do that in my business strategy and planning you know this iterative cross-functional teams all those things we learned in lean and agile and brought in with us into devops it was interesting when I think one of the first DevOps uh, enterprise summits I went to, the auditors had a panel. They're all excited right. about yeah. being part of this. They could see how they could play as part of this whole process. And that 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 was an eye opener. It's like, okay, th there's really this has gone far beyond what we thought it might be. Far beyond just developers and ops. Exactly. Um, and, and I think that's another. So I, I think that's a big lesson that will probably shine through in the DevOps Next report, which is as much as everyone wants to focus on tools, it really isn't just the tools. It's it's the culture of having a cross-functional team, of doing things like a, a blameless post-mortems, of, of you know, communication, open lines of communications, of trying to automate, go faster, but better. Right. We do it with our software, but we want, you know, we talk about platform engineering. Platform engineering is part of this whole discussion, too. Right. We want to we why do we do platform engineering to go faster, to do more Productivity. with less. Right? right. To it's that it's the same driver. It's part of the same dynamic of of what, you know, what drives DevOps and. You know, I wouldn't have guessed this 10 years ago because I, I think, fell into the trap that a lot of other people did, which is, you know, we focus on the tools. We focus mm -hmm. on the tools. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what we buy. <laughs> yeah. And, we, and, and that's who pays us here at uh, DevOps.com, right? So we focus on the tools. But I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see 
what do we hear about from a cultural pers perspective on on DevOps and how people are taking that undefined, you know, axiom around uh, culture and applying it into real life business situations, not just software development. I think that's a, a big piece of this. It's interesting for me because you know. Uh, the gray hairs mean I've been around for a while. I remember the methodology wars and it's about this is you have to follow the methodology and which methodology is the best one. And this is the next better one. And yeah, it never set right with me because every organization operates differently, right? You can't yeah. force everybody into one mold and this is the right, because I call them the religious methodology wars. I mean, it really was, it's just like, you know, you're going to heaven, you're not because you're not following, not following the methodology or whatever. And and when Agile kind of Agile came out and really made a lot of sense to me because I'd already been part of the total quality management training, and the iterative improvement and all the different techniques that we learned there and way of making it making iterative progress and, and improving quality, whatever whatever you're working on. And so when we got to, to a point of working together on DevOps and you know, you did DevOps.com to kick that off, it just it just seemed like a lot of things came together at the right time. You yeah. know, it, timing's everything. We know that from yeah, it, absolutely timing, timing is everything. And and I I think you're hundred percent right. You know, I'll tell you by the time this podcast is available, our newest site, Tech Strong ITSM will be out. And a lot of people may be saying, ITSM, that's not new. Where, where you? I got the AI thing, but why ITSM? Because when we think about the religious wars around process and around you know, how to do things, for a lot of people, ITIL, I-T-I-L, right? ITIL uh, is the very definition of it. Mm -hmm. But there's much more to ITSM, and even ITIL itself has changed over the years. Yeah. And, you know, in my, and I wrote, this was my opening, uh, my opening story on, on tech strong ITSM, my opening post was that, you know, ITSM is part of this continuum that we have, you know, agile to where agile leaves off DevOps picks up where DevOps leaves off ITSM mm -hmm. picks up. And and of course, there's places in there for things like platform engineering and SREs and SLOs, and and you know all of the various disciplines that have developed to fill in the gaps here. But there is it's definitely a continuum, and you know I and I think one of the lessons learned is again would DevOps be here if not but for Agile Lean and what would be cloud and blah blah blah. Had idle not been what it was, would DevOps have evolved differently? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And had DevOps not evolved, would idle still be what it was then instead of what it is now and what it's morphing into? That's that's a perfect example. I remember interviewing a couple of folks from Axios that wrote mm -hmm. updated idle to idle four, I believe it is. And really good. Axelos. It was Axelos. Axelos, thank you very much. Right. Um, and, and they were talking, and, and I didn't realize it, but they had gone back in that iteration and said, yeah, we kind of went down the process for process sake. That's my interpretation and in prior. It just got a little too dogmatic, again, my words. But they went back and said, how do we incorporate this stuff from Agile and DevOps? And, and they, did a, they did a yeoman's, yo person's job of trying to really open it up and make it more flexible and adaptable. And I'm sure that that process continued, but I think that at least one of the reasons why you know, Idle and ITSM you know, both are still widely adopted. You know, they, they didn't just kind of go by the wayside and something else replaced it. They're still no. a huge part of no, it. But, and they're still evolving, as is DevOps. Mitchell, we could talk about this all day, but we're never <laughs> going to get to your Ben Potter interview. Um, why don't we? Why don't you? Why don't you set the table for that one? I'd love to. Um, a, a few weeks ago, I got to speak with Ben Potter. He's had a product at a company called Coder. And I, I've long been interested in how the development environment is changing for software creators and, you know, <laughs> how far ID, IDEs have come and cloud development and 
developing at a Starbucks or in the plane, on the plane. And one of the things that what Coder does is, is provide cloud development environments, right? So you can quickly stand up or utilize in an, an environment. And if you're starting out in software, it doesn't sound like that big of a deal. Maybe it saves you some steps, right? Um, or if you're starting out on a new project, you know, it's a, it, it's a, a, a saver, an aid. When you're working in an organization where you might be supporting five or six applications or even two or three, there might be half a dozen environments or more for each one of those applications. There's this version with this database that we're supporting for these customers. Here's the second iteration of that. And you've got to have you've got to have environments to go to be able to write code, test code, deploy it for each one of those iterations. And it gets really complex really fast. And as I was talking with Ben about, you know, so I don't do this every day anymore. And it's for me to get, you know, okay, what do I need to update to get this in sync with what what's out there for that, even for for our environments? You know, it, it's it's a cognitive overload <laughs> and I'm not doing it full time every day across a lot of complex environments. And so it's a real productivity boost when you can turn it on and have that environment. And so it was pretty fascinating talking with Ben because he talks about AI and some of the new new things that are happening. I think folks are really enjoy listening to Ben. So any thoughts? Absolutely. Take a look at the video or listen. And to no, I, you know what? I know Coder is going to be with us at KubeCon in Paris. So I'm looking forward to catching up with them in person there. But let's roll. Let's go to the video from a recent TechStrong TV interview. And we'll be back right after. Well, hey, everybody. I have a great pleasure of being joined by Ben Potter. Ben is head of product with Coder. Welcome, Ben. Mitch, happy to be here. Excellent. I'm glad to have you on. Um, talking about great things, you know, and it, this has come up a couple times for me recently chatting. And when I was at KubeCon, I think in Chicago and, and talking about um, cloud development environments. Matter of fact, even a friend of mine on an AI, pro AI project and I were talking about that. So I'm really intrigued to chat with you. Um, let's just set some context for folks. You know, if you don't know what a cloud development environment, hopefully the name describes it well enough, but is there any more you should know when we're talking about what is a cloud development environment? Yeah, the, the very basics are we're trying to replace developer laptops, meaning um, developers will always need a laptop or a desktop, but um, so many applications and um, are moving to the cloud, yet developers still have to run these applications, whether it's one service, um, 10 services, or even dozens of services all on their local machine or some hybrid where they're running some on their local machine, some on the, the cloud. And um, as these environments get more complex, especially in, in large like enterprise organizations, um, it, it becomes unrealistic to be able to run these on, uh, on the the local machine, especially when a developer is essentially forced to use a lockdown Windows machine. So what we see happening is developers are creating virtual machines, they're running their code there. That also has a drift from the place they're deploying it. So what, what a cloud development environment tries to do is give developers a very identical environment to that of which they're deploying that they can test and, and develop against using their, their favorite editors, whether that's VS Code or JetBrains. So sometimes when people think cloud developer environments, they think of a, a browser editor with limited tools and limited keyboard shortcuts. Um, that's not the case. Developers can keep using their editors, but really they have an environment they're developing against that's very similar to where they'd be deploying. So that's kind of the main concept, or at least that's how we define it at, at Coder. Great. And then do you actually, well, you know, in, in IDE tools, like if you're, you know, you're using Visual Studio or whatever your favorite Python or whatever <laughs> IDE is, some of those have integrated with it, like Homebrew for your Apple, right? To be able to, to do uh, uh, package management and update and set environments in different contexts. I have to be honest with you, at least for me, I don't do it every day, but when I do it, it's kind of complex to go back and remember now how do i set that where where's that is do i need to upgrade this is that set up with my environment where i'm pushing this to it it's you know it taxes me and i you know i'm not doing hard stuff either 
Yeah, that's that's exactly right. We we have users who have to follow maybe thirty to forty five steps to get their environment set up, oh and um, those those steps are oftentimes very specific to a, an operating system or a, or a version of an operating system. Where mm. if someone upgrades to an M1 Mac, for example, and they were previously on the, the Intel ones, it's a whole new set of steps, and that hasn't been updated. So what what a lot of our users um, do is they they automate away all those steps, so a developer can just click a button and using these powerful cloud technologies such as Docker and, and, and virtual machines or even Kubernetes, uh, developers can get these reproducible environments with all their tools set up. So essentially, it turns those 30 steps into, into one. I mean, someone has to, to automate it and create those, those images, but mm -hmm. it's um, kind of a, a one-to-many relationship where you kind of have the, the confidence that everyone on the team can use that, those same tools. Cool. So what's the developer experience like? Are they using an ID that's run, IDE that's running locally on their environments, connecting to a cloud development environment? Are they using an IDE in the cloud? How does that work? Yeah. That's, that's a really good question. And there's, there's two paths that we can support. So the, the modern, um, editors, which uh, we VS Code and, and JetBrains are the two main ones, have support for running them locally on your machine, meaning you can have your theme, your keyboard shortcuts, your layout, but then you're connecting over essentially SSH into these remote servers where the file system and the terminal is. So all the tools are pre-installed on the remote server, but then it's kind of this like thin client server model. The the other option is entirely through the web browser, which is, which is pretty magical. Um, both Microsoft as well as um, us at Coder have a version of VS Code that runs entirely in the web browser. And in that case, the full IDE is running um, remotely, and a developer could connect with even an iPad or, or a Chromebook and, and do the development that way. So that one's, um, it, it, there are some limitations. Um, it's, uh, you don't get all your shortcuts, but if you're kind of quickly switching between services, it's, it's a great workflow. I could see that, especially like, hey, Ben's on vacation. I've got to step in and, and yeah, I kind of know that environment, but I'd sure like a turnkey, press a button, I'm a press a browser, you know, browser key. I'm in, I'm in and I don't have to worry about, set, you know, making sure my IDE will connect to it and okay, you know, where's the cert or credentials, et cetera, to get to that. And then how do I move around? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's kind of, it's, it's great for those kind of times that you only need to go into the environment maybe once a month. Um, it's maybe a service that you don't always maintain, or like you said, like maybe I'm on, on vacation and I only have my, my iPad and I need to hop on and, and do something. You can just kind of have the, the ease of mind that it's all there and, and working. Mm -hmm. And we, we talk a lot about, I'm trying to remember the term, but the uh, cognitive load, that's the word, um, that, that we put on developers, we do that in all kinds of jobs, but we especially put around developers of there's cognitive load of building your environment and there's cognitive load of like doing your job. And then there's everything else too. And that context switch across all of those is maddening. I mean, that's where you lose your productivity. You know, I, I, I think of software akin to writing a book. You're not going to write a book a sentence at a time. You're going to sit down and write a chapter or write part of one or this part of the story or whatever. And you got to stay there a while, right? You can't deal with interruptions. Why, it's why developers wear noiseless headphones all the time if they aren't working from home. <laughs> um, you know, how does a cloud environment help you with cognitive load and context switching? Yeah, our, our tagline actually is, is keep developers in flow. Um, and mm -hmm. we use that both internally. So how can we make sure that when we're meeting with the development team, it's only in certain times and we can reduce meetings and, and also externally in the, in the products that we build. Um, one, one of the main ways that, that we help with that is there's this huge expectation um, from, from like the, 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 the DevOps kind of paradigm for developers to start building their applications with best practices in mind, whether that's mm -hmm. where they download their packages from or how often they scan or um, what kind of languages and, and libraries they use. And um, with Coder, you can essentially create these, these recipes for developers to get into an environment that has all of those things installed for them. So if a developer goes to install a package, they don't even need to configure or run security scans. You can have confidence that they're downloading it from a trusted source, mm -hmm. wherever that those artifacts are and wherever you're scanning it from. Um, we're also seeing that with um, AI and LLM tools. We have a lot of our enterprise customers 
pre-installing these tools in for the developer so that it can kind of handle these these operations that normally you you it, it's pretty difficult to to enforce or even like encourage developers to use these best practices but by having them by default in their editor where they spend the majority of their time they don't have to spend a lot of time switching out of your editor and, and doing other stuff i think there's like a pretty famous quote that like it takes 15 minutes to like a context switcher to fully get back into flow mm -hmm. so as much as possible having these best practices pre-installed inside your editor as opposed to having to go out and read some wiki to to get things set up the right way um the, the better so we're, we're essentially trying to only like only really let developers focus on like what what they need to which is like the, the libraries and, and the, the the code and then the rest can kind of take care of take care of itself through automation mm -hmm. i like to i like to say the best way or fast way to get something done is not to have to do it at all right but <laughs> just let it be done for you right if you can um, well, let's talk, let's talk about the AI side of this, because one of the questions I have is about a cloud development environment is, you know, not all the resources could be put in the cloud or into your environment, right? I have databases, I have APIs that I'm testing with to third party services, my own applications, you know, a plethora of things that, you know, no, there is no, no application is an island, right? It's, it's all connecting to everything. How do you do with that? Um, deal with when you need to talk to other services or maybe in your LLM, your training data, and you need to keep that updated with the, the latest that you're using or that's coming, you know, getting ready to get pushed to production. How, how do you deal with the external things that aren't in your cloud environment? Yeah. So we uh, have a, a kind of policy, the way we deliver our software that we only want it to be self-hosted, meaning we give the software to our customers and they install it in their AWS or, or on-prem environments. Um, that's because we have a lot of um, secure regulated customers who mm -hmm. very, really much value owning their, their network. So that, that gives them control over which endpoints and, and network things they want to expose. So one argument or one example I had earlier was ensuring that artifacts only get downloaded from a secure artifact store, as opposed to the, the public registries such as Docker hub or NPM where um, there's, there's, no there's so many vulnerabilities there. It's all there. good. It's yeah. all secure. Don't worry. <laughs> exactly. Um, and and on the on the AI side, we we do have um, even some of the most like regulated customers using AI with Coder, but they have control over that those network firewalls, whether they have an, an on prem model that they're using or something um, exposed through ChatGPT. They expose only the the aspects that they want. What's super interesting about AI to me is that um, even the, the, the customers that really value security are accepting the risk to use these AI models because of the productivity benefits that they have. And, and at Coder, you can kind of, well, we use it because it's self-hosted, you have control over the full the full network that it's, it's deployed on. Um, another use case we've seen is it's uh, pretty difficult to get developers access to, to GPUs. Um, mm. there's, there's a way to, for developers to like schedule, if you're doing AI development, maybe to schedule out to a build farm. And another use case that we've seen for people who are doing very advanced AI development is they want a full GPU workspace in the cloud or even multiple workspaces. So we, we have templates at Coder that let developers get a, a workspace with a GPU attached. So if they're training a model or working against a, um, if they're working against a local LLM that, that isn't like training based on your company data, that they have the, the horsepower to do so in their, in their cloud. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, how about data protection, right? Test data. Right? Uh, you, you need to test with realistic data. Sometimes it's, you know, data you don't want to escape, right? You don't, you don't want that data leaked. How do you protect assets like that? Sounds like what you just described would help with that. If you're running it within your own, you know, you're in your own environments with your own security controls. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, the way that we're seeing our users doing this now is they're deploying a, a database with, with either customer data or mock customer data inside the same network that they have code deployed in, meaning that a developer doesn't have to open a firewall on their local machine to access it. They're only mm -hmm. connecting it to it through their cloud IDE. So this cloud IDE is on the same network as the customer data or test data or mock data, and multiple developers are able to develop against it. So they're not downloaded onto each CDE. They're not downloaded on to each local laptop, which is a huge security risk, it's all staying within the boundaries of, of your network. And it can even stay in the, within the boundaries of a, of a web browser, which then can be secured to make sure people aren't copy and pasting out of it and, and doing things like that. So we, the, the, the real benefit there is because you can put coder in your own network where the data is, it can never, it never has to leave that, um, that network. It can all just stay in, in the web browser or in, on that. 
Excellent. environment. Um, so kind of last, last question, I, I could talk to you for another two hours, but last question is, um, you know, right tool for the right job, right? Um, what, maybe what are things that aren't a great, you know, fit for trying to use a cloud development environment? So don't go down that path. That's not the best way to do it. Yeah. Anything that's super, um, latency sensitive. So mm -hmm. web development is a perfect example of what's great. You can develop against a, a modern editor such as VS Code. You can preview your changes in the web browser. Um, that's great. If you're developing a video game, um, you'll I'm run into some issues because the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the game is, is compiling and, and developing uh, and essentially being sent back. So you can get a full desktop environment through Coder, but it's it's pretty slow and it's it's not ideal. I'd, I'd much rather do game development on my, my local laptop. Mm -hmm. um, another one that comes to mind is, is iOS development. Again, this is one of those things where technically it could be done. We created our, our product to run on, on Mac hardware, but there isn't a great solution for provisioning Mac hardware for iOS development. There, there are some solutions out there that I'm closely looking at because I'm, I'm interested. Um, but if you're doing any form of kind of app or game or even even desktop development, it's not ideal. Again, it, it can be done if you if you have some of those, those pain points, such as like data security, but um, web development using Visual Studio code, as well as like JetBrains, is really the, the sweet spot that we're seeing yeah. now. Um, what, what I think some people think when they hear CDE is that if you have a large complex service, it's actually not a good fit for a CDE. And we're actually seeing the opposite, which is the more complex the service you have, the, the more you benefit from automating those steps mm -hmm. away and giving it to a developer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think something else is if people people think maybe if they're later or earlier on in their cloud native journey that it's not a good time for CDEs until they're fully onto the cloud. And the opposite is also true. We we have um, some of our largest customers are using CDEs to get more developers to develop applications for the cloud with those those practices. So um, those are kind of two things that you you might think wouldn't be a good fit, but would. But yeah, it, the the game development is is not it's not great. I, I tried it. It's not it's not fun. <laughs> Yeah. It's always those edge cases or, or unique cases. And you, yeah. you know, you mentioned Mac and Xcode isn't really <laughs> happy to run itself in other environments. I'm sure that's a bit of a challenge. Well, where can folks kick the tires? You know, um, anybody that's a developer, technical person, we like to, you know, let us turn us loose, let us check it out, kind of see how it works. Yeah, our, our website is coder.com and our GitHub is also coder. So it's pretty, pretty easy to remember. Um, on the, the website, you can get a trial to try the, the enterprise features, but the core product itself is actually open source. So uh, if you're a developer and want this either for your, your home setup or maybe a, a small team, entirely free. Um, and then we have that enterprise trial on coder.com as well. Okay. Excellent. Well, Ben, it's been fascinating talking with you. Um, I'm definitely headed there. I'm going to go check it out. So <laughs> coder.com, right? Is it.com? That's right. right. Yeah. yeah coder.com. You always got to ask these days because sometimes it's not. I hope you'll come back again. It's uh, been fascinating talking with you, Ben Potter, with head of product with Coder. Thanks, man. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Mitch, Mitchell, that was a great interview. You did a nice job there with Ben and, and good cool. for them. I, I like what Coder is doing. It is. And Ben was fast, fantastic to talk to because he's working with so many different customers and he's got all these experiences and use cases and as well as heading up product. He's not just a product, you know, here's the here's the roadmap and here's where we're going. He's really out there pressing the flesh and rubbing elbows with developers and figuring out what they need. So I think that's what made it such a compelling uh, interview and discussion with him. Yep. Many thank you to much, many thanks to Ben and the coder folks. Um, Mitch, I think we're probably a little over time because of the interview and everything. But this was a great DevOps chat. Um, we'll be back next week with another one. Sounds good. Same place, same bat station, bat channel, right? Yeah, wherever you're listening to this, keep that dial where it is. For uh, Tech Strong and DevOps chat, this is Alan Schimmel. And Mitchell Ashley. Take care. We'll see you soon.